Yes. Okay, so hit pause recording. Ah, cool. Just to make sure that we have, you know, just as many people as possible to be able to uh, to, to, to see what's going on here. Um, but at the same point in time, we have a really special guest. So, um, Ricardo, I think I'm going to go ahead and just start right now. Yes. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being able to teach this class. Um, my name, I guess I should start out with, I'm Jesse Baker. I'm a professor in the Masters of Environmental Management program. And I've been privileged to co-teach a class um, with Dr. Ricardo Vasquez Perales here um, titled Climate Change from Science to Action. Um, so I just think it's awesome that we get to have this experience tonight. Uh, I've really enjoyed being able to teach with Ricardo. So Ricardo, why don't you go ahead and um, just sort of take things from here and then you can introduce um, Mr. Heiberg. Of course, and um, thank you, Dr. Baker. And also I am pleased, really honored to teach with you this climate action, climate change from science to action. Uh, and in this class, our students have been learning many resources from science to action and um, for this session particularly, we wanted to open and to share what our students are learning to the whole community of Western Colorado University and abroad that. Um, with that said, I just also want to welcome our special guest today, Richard Heinberg. And I want to tell some uh, things that in my particular story, um, since more than 10 years, I have been a reader of books of Richard Heinberg and also taught in courses in Mexico uh, in the US. My courses have been based on his um, knowledge and his books. Richard is a senior fellow of the Post Carbon Institute and is regarded as one of the world's foremost advocates for a shift away from our current reliance on fossil fuels. He is the author of 14 books, including some of the seminal works on society's current energy and environmental sustainability crisis. Just to mention some of these books, his recent book is Power, Limits and Prospects for Human Survival, Our Renewable Future, Laying the Path for 100% Clean Energy, and The End of Growth, Adapting to Our New Economic Reality, among them. Richard, this is really a pleasure and a honor for us welcoming you all. And the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Ricardo, and thank you, Jesse. Um, thanks for inviting me. And uh, we'll get the slideshow going here. Um, well, over the course of the next 45 minutes, I hope to uh, put climate change in a kind of perspective that, that uh, you may not have heard before. I'm, I'm not sure what uh, those of you in the course have, have been studying so far, but I've, I've been studying energy, climate change, and other sustainability uh, issues for several decades now. And as, as I've done so, I've, I've seen increasingly that it's important to have a context in which to understand these, uh, these problems. Otherwise, they seem like isolated difficulties that we can solve with this or that uh, uh, technological fix or policy fix. But it's it's really a, a, a bigger reality that we need to try to wrap our heads around before we're going to be able to do something that, that really makes a difference. So we're talking about energy. Climate change is, a, is an energy problem. It's a re result of our burning fossil fuels. And when we're talking about energy, really, we're talking about everything. If you want to understand any organism, ecosystem, or human society, follow the energy. I, I used to say, follow the money. Well, money is a stand-in for energy. Uh, it, money is what gives us access to energy in a, in a society that has money and a financial system and so on. But it's the energy that does the work. Without the energy, the money is just meaningless numbers. So over the last couple of hundred years, we've gained access to sources of energy that are 
completely unprecedented in all human history. We were always using energy, but it was energy in the form of food, uh, firewood. Uh, all, an all animals and plants use energy. Plants, of course, get their energy directly from the sun. Animals uh, get their energy from plants and from sometimes eating one another. Okay, but human beings have developed this ability to use energy from the environment in other ways. It started when we mastered fire itself, uh, burning firewood and so on. But then, again, just these last couple of hundred years, gaining the access to fossil fuels changed everything. How did that happen? Well, we had to develop some technologies first. Actually, we did an experiment about a thousand years ago. It wasn't a deliberate experiment, but looking back on it, it, it kind of is. Uh, in China, around 1000 AD, uh, there was the beginnings of capitalism. There was privatization of land. Uh, there was encouragement for uh, innovation, technological invention. And there was lots of coal lying around and people were starting to burn coal in larger and larger quantities to heat buildings, to smelt metal and so on. So this was like an, an, an industrial revolution that was getting going, but the government shut it down. Why so? Well, the, the Chinese government at the time was ruled by a hereditary aristocracy. And they saw these, these new industrialists as a threat to their power. So they shut them down. And so it had the Industrial Revolution had to wait another 700 years or so until the British started burning coal. They also had encouragement for innovation, government protection for investors, uh, private ownership of land, and so on. But it didn't get shut down in this instance. Why? Because Britain had engaged in colonization uh, uh, starting, you know, 500 years ago, uh, was one of the European countries that fanned out across the planet and and uh, basically stole land from indigenous peoples all over the all over the globe, and so there was already this wealthy class of of traders that had already challenged the power of the hereditary aristocracy to a certain extent. So when the industrialists came along, powered by fossil fuels, it wasn't so easy to shut them down. Well, why are fossil fuels such a big deal? Consider this, a barrel of oil, for which these days we pay, what, 80 bucks, something like that, has about as much energy as 25,000 hours of human labor. So uh, if, if we pay 20 bucks an hour for that labor, it'll be worth, what, a half a million dollars? And we're paying 80 bucks for it? That is cheap energy. And that's why we've mechanized every process we possibly could over the last, especially the last century. This is what agriculture looked like before fossil fuels. Lots of human labor. This is what it looks like today. Um, Back in uh, 1800, before the fossil fuel revolution, 90% of people worked on the farm, worked at agriculture in order to produce a surplus to supply the 10% of people who lived in towns and, and cities. And those, those that 10% of the occupation could be soldiers or clerks or or uh, actors, <laughs> you know, they, they did all the rest of the stuff, right? But that's changed over the last several decades. Uh, this is a, a, a graph from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It says farm jobs as a percent of total U.S. jobs. Well, that's kind of misleading because if you go back to 1800, all these people didn't have jobs on the farm. They didn't, they weren't on a payroll. They didn't this wasn't a profession where they they got a salary. No, they, these were private landowners or enslaved people, or sometimes very large landowners. Uh, but all of that shifted during the last couple of hundred years. The biggest demographic trend, aside from population growth, has been urbanization. People moving off the farms into towns and cities and getting jobs. So. Now it's normal for people to have a job. In 1800, 
virtually no one had a job in the sense of regular employment at, at a certain salary. But today it's quite normal. This is what it looks like, global energy consumption over the last 200 years. And it's quite a joy ride we've been on. The economy has grown because it could, because we have the, we've had the energy with which to extract materials in larger quantities from the Earth's crust uh, and more quickly to transform them into industrial products, to transport those products from where resources are abundant to where they're scarce. And all of this looks like growth. You'll notice the increase in world energy usage between 1950 and about 1975. That was the fastest rate of increase in energy usage in all of human history. It was also the period of the fastest economic growth and the fastest population growth in all of human history. So these things do go together. This, this is population. The rate of population growth has gone down. So instead of 2% per year, which is what it was in uh, the 1970s, now it's 1% per year, roughly speaking. Okay. But, you know, in the 1970s, that was 2% of 4 billion people that we were adding every year. Today, it's 1% of 8 billion people that we're adding every year. So if you do the math, it's on a numerical basis, we're still adding the same number of people every year as we were in the 1970s. About 80 million per year we're adding to the global population. That's births over deaths. Well, this is, this is a picture of what an economy looks like according to most economists. But I added a little question, what's missing here? You know, we have producers and consumers, isn't that, isn't that it? Well, no, where does all the stuff come from? It has to come from the earth, all the raw materials for all the products that we produce, including, including food, but you know, everything else. And so over the course of the last number of decades, as the economy has grown, we've started thinking about it differently. We've started thinking of the economy as a thing to be measured and tracked. That wasn't the case in the 19th century. And now growth of the economy, we measure it in GDP, gross domestic product. And the goal of all politicians and economists now is to see the economy continue to grow. Why? Well, because that brings all kinds of good things, more jobs, more profits for industry, more, more uh, returns to investors. So everybody agrees that economic growth is, is a good thing, and it's energy that brings it to us. But, you know, on a finite planet, nothing can grow forever. Uh, this is not mentioned in the economics textbooks, but, you know, it really should be because anything that's growing at 1% a year is doubling in size every 70 years. It's just, you know, kind of simple arithmetic. You can, you can do it yourself. If it's growing at 2% per year, it doubles in size every 35 years and, and so on. The, the math is, is easy to do in your head. So these days, economists say, well, the, it's natural for the economy to grow at 2 to 3% per year. Fine. Okay. What does that actually mean in physical terms? It means the economy is doubling in size every 25 years. Just in the last 25 years, the amount of waste we produce every year has doubled. The amount of raw materials that get fed into the economy has doubled just in 25 years. Uh, in the last 25 years, the we've used half the non-renewable resources extracted since the beginning of human beings. So all of this looks like I've used the term joyride. It's it's quite a, a remarkable thing that's that's been happening over the past few decades. But given the fact that it's all based on fossil fuels, it looks kind of like a bargain with the devil. Why? Because first of all, fossil fuels are finite. They're depleting as we use them. And second, as we burn them, it's causing climate change. So I'm not going to talk that much about fossil fuel depletion, but there's a simple principle we should understand. And that's the principle of low-hanging fruit. That's how we extract 
non-renewable resources from, from the Earth's crust. We go after the, the cheapest to extract, the highest quality resources first, and we leave the harder to get, more expensive to get, nastier, more polluting stuff for later. So if, if you want to understand it in a little more detail, this diagram is helpful. There are what geologists call the conventional resources, conventional oil and gas, and then the unconventional resources. We've pretty much burned through most of the high quality conventional resources when it comes to petroleum. And now we're digging into the unconventional resources, the Canadian tar sands, the uh, light tight oil in the US that's produced by hydrofracturing or fracking. And you see this uh, energy in equals energy out uh, line here. Well, that's really important to get because the whole purpose of extracting fossil fuels is to get energy out of them. But it takes energy to get that energy. It takes energy to explore for, drill for, uh, extract oil and process it. And if you're spending more energy in doing those things than the oil has in it, then there's no point in the exercise anymore. And with some of the oil that we're getting now, like the Canadian tar sands, it's getting the, the energy profit ratio is declining pretty substantially. In fact, the energy profit ratio for the petroleum industry as a whole is, is declining and has been for, for uh, the last couple of decades, really. But especially in the last decade, that process is, is speeding up. So we know we have to shift away from our reliance on fossil fuels just for that reason, because these are finite substances that are depleting, but also there's climate change. So those of you who are in the class on climate change, the next couple of slides will not be news to you. Uh, CO2 emissions have been increasing. And we note the only times when CO2 emissions have actually declined have been periods of economic contraction. Whenever the economy is growing fast, we get more emissions. When the economy slows down, the amount of emissions slows down also. So this is the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. That's a different thing. Uh, how many parts, we measure that in terms of parts per million. And we started out at 280 parts per million. Now we're about up to 420 parts per million. And you can see uh, Rio, Kyoto, Paris, what, are, what were those? Those were the big climate conferences, the IPCC of the United Nations, world, the, the world's countries got together and made commitments to reduce their carbon emissions, and we can see what happens. So far, not much. So this is globe, actual global warming temperature. Uh, uh, global temperatures averaged out and measured over, uh, over the past number of decades, and we see a clear correlation. Now, the vast majority of uh, scientists who look at these trends uh, agree that this is being caused by these two things. Not everybody does. Uh, there are still some doubters, but they're in among scientists, they're in the very small minority. Uh, the general consensus, and I'd say the overwhelming consensus, is that these two things are what's causing this. There are still some things we don't know. We don't know climate sensitivity exactly. In other words, if we increase the uh, CO2 content of the atmosphere by one part per million, exactly how much warming does that cause? Well, we have a ball, at this point, we have a ballpark uh, understanding of that, but uh, there, there are still uh, unknowns with regard to that. And particularly with regard to feedback tipping points, because there are features of the global ecosystem that uh, can act as runaway feedbacks. Uh, for, for example, the ice in the polar regions of the planet is, is white if you're looking at the earth from space and white reflects energy back into space very effectively. But as that ice melts, it reveals dark ocean waters and that dark color absorbs 
energy more effectively and heats the earth more. So we have a self-reinforcing feedback process. And the more of those get going, the less predictable this whole process becomes. Now, historically, the top emitters have been the United States, Europe, former Soviet Union, uh, Japan, Canada, Australia, all the so-called developed or the rich countries in the world are historically responsible for most greenhouse gas emissions. But today, the top emitter is actually China. Uh, and that's a success story. China has brought several hundred million of its people out of poverty. But how is it done so? By burning coal. Same thing is happening in India. So it's not just a question of the wealthy countries anymore. It's, it's gotten more complicated. But if you look at it on a per capita basis, it's still US, Canada, and other uh, wealthier countries, hands down, that have been, uh, that are most responsible for greenhouse gas emissions. So what, is, what does the future look like? Well, uh, we know that climate impacts are already happening. We know that they're likely to be worst in Africa, South Asia. Why South Asia? Because uh, so many people in South Asia get their water from glaciers in the Himalayas, and those glaciers are melting. So they're there are likely to be significant impacts on water supply, agriculture, and, and so on in South Asia. Um, drought, storms, flooding, crop failures, and the wet bulb temperatures phenomenon is something that I, I'm not going to take time to explain it now because it's a little complicated, but uh, write it down and Google it for later because it's pretty scary. There are places on the planet that are going to become so hot, at least periodically, that humans simply can't survive without air conditioning. Um, and of course, air conditioning means more energy use, more greenhouse gas emissions, at least the way we're doing it now. These are the representative concentration pathways of that the IPCC runs. These are scenario studies, uh, computer modeling studies. Um, and so the, the idea is, you know, what what are the likely trajectories of global carbon emissions and what will be the resulting warming? And you'll see lots of squiggly lines there. That's because they try to tweak these processes as much as they can in as many ways as they can. You can actually do pretty much this yourself with a, a free uh, website called uh, C-ROADS, C-R-O-A-D-S. And there's a companion site, En-ROADS, E-N hyphen R-O-A-D-S. And it's a dashboard and you can tweak all the variables that go into our energy system and the global economy and see what that does to carbon emissions and, and temperatures. But again, here the IPC is, IPCC has done this. Now the RCP 8.5, which is uh, definitely the worst scenario. That's the worst case scenario. It's often described as the business as usual scenario where we get to, you know, like five degrees warming by the end of the, of the century or possibly more. Uh, my colleagues and I at Post Carbon Institute think that's a very unlikely scenario. Why is that? Is it because we're confident that everybody is going to adopt renewable energy very rapidly and so on. No, it's because we probably don't have enough burnable fossil fuels to get us there. Uh, we see RCP 4.5 as being probably the most likely uh, emissions and temperature traje trajectory. And that gets us probably to about three degrees of warming, unless we really get busy with the energy transition. So what would that mean? Well, if the world is trying to keep global warming down to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But if we were if we're to do that, that requires a near total decarbonization of the economy really soon, like 2035, that's just a little over a decade from now. Is that going to happen? Well, 
it's uh, that's an extraordinarily ambitious goal, and I'll explain why. Uh, this is current primary energy consumption for the U.S. Uh, by uh, by energy source. And if you just look at that bar on the right, it looks pretty good, you know, uh, 2% geothermal, 9% solar, 22% hydroelectric. Oh, but that's just that little slice of, of the whole pie that's renewable energy. Renewable energy is only 11% of the whole deal. And sometimes it's easy to get... Um, confused about this because so many people who write about energy confuse energy with electricity. They'll say, oh, uh, such and such country is getting 90% of its energy from wind and solar. Well, what they actually mean to say is it's getting 90% of its electricity from wind and solar. But electricity globally is only about 20% of total energy usage. The rest, that other 80% of the energy that we use is in the form of you know, natural gas, petroleum, et cetera. So actually we have a big job ahead of us. We need to electrify a lot of what we're doing right now, not just transportation, but industrial processes. This picture is a cement kiln. That's where we make cement which is the key ingredient of concrete. And concrete is literally the foundation of modern industrial society. Just think where we'd be without concrete for roads, for buildings, even to anchor wind turbines, we use concrete, right? So how do you make concrete with cement? And cement is made in these kilns that operate at 1500 degrees Celsius, 24 seven, 365 days a year. Could you run that on renewable energy? Well, maybe theoretically, currently nobody is doing it uh, because it would be much more expensive. Same thing with aviation. It's gonna be very hard to electrify. Uh, there are a lot of companies looking at alternative fuels for aircraft at uh, maybe some electric planes for short distances carrying a few people. But you know, batteries just are not as energy dense as jet fuel, which is kerosene. So it's uh, if you wanted to run a, a plane, you know, fly a plane with 300 people across the Pacific Ocean uh, with batteries, that battery would be so heavy you wouldn't be able to get the plane off the ground. So we have we have to rethink a lot of the ways that we're using energy. Also, Solar and wind are intermittent sources of energy. The sun doesn't always shine, wind doesn't always blow. So that means we have to do a lot of energy storage and not only storage for a few hours here and there, but also seasonally, we have to look at how to make energy available when we want to use it. Or we, alternative, we have to think of how to use energy when it's available rather than just, you know, switching on the light any old time. Another consideration with renewable energy sources is the materials requirements. Just sand is a really big factor for making concrete, for making silicon. And it's these require certain kinds of sand that are actually getting very scarce. Uh, do we have enough sand? Do we have enough lithium? silver, copper, and a whole whole list of raw materials. Yeah, we probably do for the first generation of renewable energy infrastructure, but then all of that stuff is gonna to have to be replaced every 25 to 40, 50 years. So what we do then, well, we'll have to recycle as much as we can, but there are limits to recycling. Uh, with many materials, as you recycle them, they degrade. So recycling has a practical limit of maybe 80%, 60, 80, possibly 90% if we get better at it. So far, despite rapid growth of solar and wind power, emissions are continuing to increase. Why is that? Well, renewable energy is adding to, so far, 
rather than displacing energy from fossil fuels, except in certain situations. But if you look at it globally, the global situation, this is this is what's going on. And it's largely because of economic growth. Politicians, economists demanding more economic growth. How do we get more economic growth? Well, in the first instance, we do it by burning more fossil fuels. We, and the amount of increased energy usage in most years so far has been greater than the amount of new energy we're, energy we're adding from renewable sources. That may change in the years immediately ahead because we are increasing renewable energy rapidly. But so far, that's the case. And you can see it in this graph we've already looked at. So um, climate change is the biggest environmental problem humanity has ever created or has ever faced. But it's not all we're dealing with today. Because the human economy and human population have been growing so rapidly, we're creating a whole raft of problems simultaneously. We're taking habitat away from other species so that 70% of animal species, not just mammals, but you know, fish and insects, and, uh, 70%, the, the, no, the average species has lost 70% of its population, average animal species. So not every species, there are probably crows are doing pretty well, rats are doing pretty well, but um, the, the vast majority of insect species, bird species, mammal species are seeing population declines in the range of about 70%. Part of that is pollution, environmental pollution from pesticides, herbicides, plastics. Part of it is, uh, is, is just taking habitat away from other creatures. We're depleting resources and we're doing it all very unequally. Most of pollution is happening in poorer communities rather than wealthy communities. And poorer communities are providing lots of cheap labor Poorer countries are providing cheap labor and energy. U the U.S. has actually seen its energy consumption go down in recent years. Why? Because China is burning its cheap coal in order to produce the products that we're then buying in the U.S. So how are we doing in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S.? In order to really understand, you have to look at the global picture rather than just or our domestic energy usage. <clears throat> this is global terrestrial vertebrate biomass. Vertebrates, of course, including fish, birds, mammals, uh, and so on. And you can, <laughs> humans, livestock, wild animals are 3% of terrestrial vertebrate biomass now. We have successfully taken over the planet but what's the consequence of that? A, a good overarching way of understanding the human predicament in the 20th, 21st century is not just climate change, but overshoot. Overshoot is a concept from population biology. Uh, let's say you have a population of field mice, voles, and uh, you get a really rainy year. So you get a lot of growth of, of small green plants that are good food for the voles. So the population of voles explodes. What happens then? Well, the voles consume a lot of that food. So that increase in carrying capacity, environmental carrying capacity for voles gets eaten away. At the same time, with all of these voles, of course, that encourages the population growth of foxes, hawks, and so on. So the predators of voles. So the population of voles explodes in the, in the first instance, but then it declines later on. So I would suggest and many human ecologists who look at this situation and come to the same conclusion. What we're seeing right now is a population overshoot of Homo sapiens as a result of, of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels have made all the resources we depend upon more readily available in larger quantities. 
fossil fuels and have, have enabled us to transport necessary uh, resources, including food and, and even water, from where they're abundant to where they're scarce to support more people. This is a good thing, but what if the carrying capacity of our planet gets degraded, as happens with the voles? You know, they eat up that that seasonal surplus of green plants and, and the carrying capacity declines again. Well, climate change is only one of the ways in which we're degrading future carrying capacity for humans of planet Earth. So the solution for climate change has to be more than just building renewable energy infrastructure, building machines to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. All those are good things. I'm not saying they aren't. But we have to think more deeply about this problem. Um, if you want to save CO2 in, in your personal life, what should you actually do? Well, here, here are some choices you could make in your life. And the size of the dot is the size of the impact that would actually have. And it turns out that you know, having one fewer child makes the bit more difference than anything else. Um, it's not just the technologies we choose, it's the size of our consumption. Uh, my wife and I have been doing this work for many years, and we've, you know, we have solar panels on our roof. We drive an electric car. We, we have um, solar cookers, a solar greenhouse, and you know, I could go on and on to, and describe all the things that that we're doing. And if you if you're interested in knowing more, you can ask in the question period. But we found as we do the the math that it's when we subtract something that we're doing that we actually get. The, the biggest change in our greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Like if we if we fly less, that's the biggest 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 change that we see in our in our life in our personal carbon footprint. So we're we're approaching a transformative moment. We human beings as a species, economic growth is going to come to an end this century. Perhaps not, you know, 2100, maybe much sooner than that. Why do I say that with some confidence? Because as I was saying earlier, nothing grows forever on a finite planet. And the conditions that led to rapid economic growth during the past few decades, those conditions are changing. At the same time that economic growth is ending, we have the requirement for massive new investment in alternative energy. You know, it took us decades and decades and decades to build up our fossil fuel infrastructure. And we're talking about switching out that vast infrastructure in a matter of a couple of decades. That's, uh, that's a huge project, and it's going to require massive amounts of new investment. And as we're doing those things, the environmental impacts from what we're currently doing right now are soaring. So the world is going to be changing over the next couple of decades in really dramatic ways, one way or another, depending on how successfully we navigate this change. And I would suggest that in addition to you know, building solar panels and, and so on, we also need to be thinking about societal resilience. Resilience is the ability of a species, ecosystem, or society to absorb disturbance and still retain its basic structure and function. We need more resilience in all of our fundamental systems, our food system, our water system. Uh, and what, so what does that mean? It means more redundancy in critical systems dispersed system control points, dispersed inventories and balancing feedback loops as opposed to self-reinforcing feedback loops. So what this translates to a more localized and diverse economy, which is, is exactly the opposite of what we've been aiming for over the past few decades. Uh, ask the average macroeconomist and they'll tell you, well, we should have more economic efficiency. That means well, if you can grow corn cheaper than in Iowa than any place else, then you should grow all of your corn in Iowa, and Iowa should grow nothing but corn because it's, that's what it's really good at. But that creates a brittle system because if the 
Iowa corn crop fails, then nobody has corn, right? And Iowa has nothing. So globalization and, uh, and economic efficiency have given us cheaper products, but they've made our overall economic system more brittle. Same thing with mechanization. It's given us cheaper stuff and we we're able to do lots of things with it really cool things but if we're facing a future of less energy and less reliable energy then we need to rethink mechanization and start thinking about how we can do some of those things in maybe old-fashioned ways simpler ways using more labor as opposed to machine power uh, we at, at Post Carbon Institute believe that the, the key place to intervene in the system is at the community level to build community resilience. Why is that? It's because it gets people working together and talking together. It's in the community where we feel most responsible for, we have the most agency in making the decisions that shape our lives. Uh, you can talk to people in your community What's going on in Washington, D.C. or Brussels? That's so far away, and it's so difficult to impact what's happening there. I'm not suggesting, you know, give up on national politics and don't vote. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is get involved in your local community. Um, I, I know when my wife and I had to flee our home a few years ago because of wildfires here in Sonoma County in Northern California, it was our neighbors who came to the rescue. They knocked on our door in the middle of the night and said, hey, look at that. And we looked out our front door and there were, you know, fires headed our direction, winds blowing in our direction. And we, you know, packed up our stuff and got out. And it's a good thing we did. But we wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been for our neighbors. And I could tell you more stories. But it's, you know, in when push comes to shove, it's it's your community that will be your support network. So how do you build resilience in your local community? Focus on food first, because that's everybody is interested in food. It's something we can talk about without getting angry. It's something we all need. Uh, and, you know, people love food. So localize our food system as much as possible. Get involved in local local food, farmers markets. Uh, find out who are the who are the farmers in in your region. Uh, find ways to reduce fuel dependency in local systems, local transport systems. Uh, you could suggest to your local town council or city council that they, you know, appoint a, a committee to look into energy dependency and how to how to shift that uh, to make it more make systems more resilient within the city. We need more alternative energy. I, as as complex as the switch to solar and wind power is likely to be, we need to build as much of it now as we possibly can. Why so? Because we have digitized so much of human knowledge. You know, if the grid were to go down now, once and for all, we would lose. You know, first of all, a lot of people would die because we depend on. Uh, electricity services for all kinds of things. But also we would lose so much knowledge and you know, financial records and everything else. We need to cre keep the grid going. So in order to do that, we're going to need renewable energy. S energy for other purposes uh, in the food system and transportation, we're going to have to negotiate uh, in those areas of how we do things and find ways to do do those things with less overall energy and and with, sometimes with more labor. We also need to help nature adapt. You know, trees need to be migrating right now from places that are warming to places that are, you know, going to be, going to have the kind of climate that those tree species are used to and are adapted to. But trees can't move very fast. Uh, climate change is moving faster than trees can adapt. So we need to be helping forests to migrate. Uh, that's just one example, but finding ways to protect 
ecosystems preserve habitat and help nature adapt are extremely important right now. That's as important as any other work there is. So I see we've I've used my 45 minutes and um, I'm really curious to know what what observations and uh, and questions you all have. So um, let's have a let's have a discussion. Thank you, Richard. And with this presentation you have given us, um, students, we open the space for questions and answers. So, um, yeah, let's let's wait a little bit to have questions. Yeah, I know I've given you all a lot to chew on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have not much here. Yes. I'm also wondering, Ricardo, um, if people know to ask questions in the Q&A session. Looks like we do have one question here. Um, Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'll just go ahead and read it, Richard, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, it's this from uh, Alexandra Kostic, one of our MEM students. I found the video so informative and comprehensible and the last segment talks about how once manufacturer moved to polluting countries where labor is cheap, the U.S. financial sector becomes 40 percent of the economy and that Wall Street is over leveraged. And then the banks soar and unemployment sources eventually leading to credit evaporating. And essentially, the economy is on the verge of collapse. And I understood I understood after seeing the date this was published that this was foreshadowing the future cascade of events. And I wanted to say how accurate this is and was wondering your thoughts on digital currency and what is happening in China with the central bank digital currency and becoming the first major economy to launch an official central bank digital currency. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm no expert on central bank digital currencies. I know this is a, this is a kind of a new thing and the U S federal reserve is also studying, uh, it hasn't yet launched a digital cur currency, but it's studying how to do so. Um, <clears throat> I don't personally expect that this is going to be as big a deal as some people are, are saying. Um, the idea is for central bank digital currencies to replace some of the cryptocurrencies that are currently largely being used for illegal purposes, you know, to finance uh, you know, just all kinds of illegal operations, um, and to keep keep money off the books, essentially. Uh, so central banks want want to have currencies that have the advantages of cryptocurrencies, but but not the disadvantages. Uh, okay, uh, money is already overwhelmingly electronic. All right. It, the amount of actual currency, physical currency, dollar bills and ten dollar bills and so on that are in circulation is a small, very small fraction of the total money supply. The vast majority of that money exists in bank accounts, savings accounts, investments as, you know, digits. So it's not that big a shift, actually. And I there I've seen some conspiracy theories around about the the central bank digital currencies, that this is going to be a way of controlling the masses and so on. Maybe. I don't see that myself, but uh, I don't I don't see everything. So who knows? And to add to your answer, Richard, I would like to tell um, that digital currencies, as any other money, are a claim on resources, especially on future resources. And there should be a correspondence between a currency, whatever digital or paper, with the biophysical world. So then if we move to digital currencies, this is, again, continuing to be a claim on resources to be paid in the present and especially in the future. That's an excellent point. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And we have another question. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, so, Ayn Vu, uh, she asks, um, you are talking about the IPCC conferences 
and how solutions or proposed actions from those conferences are not as effective as they had presented themselves. What do you think um, are the reasons behind this? Uh, yeah, the IPCC is a huge uh, organization, and uh, uh, it, it represents, of course, the scientific community, but also the, the policymakers around the world. And so reaching consensus in this huge organization is is very, very difficult. And that can, consensus can be... Um, you know, temporarily hijacked. I think for for a while there was there was a, a, a lot of discussion in the IPCC about uh, you know drawing down atmospheric CO two using technology. You know, building machines to take CO two out of the atmosphere, and then you know smarter folks <laughs> pointed out that this really doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It it may work at the laboratory scale, but it takes so so much energy to do that. And if the whole point is to have an energy transition, and that's going to be very difficult, the last thing you want to do is add another energy load on top of all the things that we're already doing, transportation, food production, and so on. Now, we also want to spend an enormous amount of energy decarbonizing the atmosphere. Doesn't, doesn't make sense. So the IPCC um, now a, is, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say a, a follow-up kind of a transitional question that's attached to that from uh, Donnie Duvall, one of our students, is while needing to shift away from an economic growth model to a steady state economy, what practices on a local level can we um, persuade our communities to adopt, which sort of tied in with the earlier right. question of, of the kind of seeming futility of the IPCC. And then I don't want to forget Katya. Um, she asked about uh, proposed solutions in the aviation industry um, for alternative batteries, which are prohibitively heavy, right, um, which right. isn't oh. connected, but I jumped ahead, so I didn't want to think that I forgot <laughs> about the question. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do both, okay? Um, so first of all, oh, uh, I've got these in front of me, but they are continually moving around. So uh, the first, the aviation industry. Um, so the 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 most likely solution is alternative fuels, and here again, that's a solution that works very well in the laboratory. It's possible to uh, make hydrogen from water through electrolysis. Uh, and then take the hydrogen and combine it with CO2 from the atmosphere and make a synthetic fuel, methanol or, you know, a, a number of, of possibilities. But that's going to be very expensive fuel. And, and we're talking in that case about creating a whole new industry because we can't just repurpose the, the oil and gas industry. To, to making this, this other kind of fuel. It's a whole different process. So we're talking about building a whole new industry that will be roughly the scale maybe of the petroleum industry in order to provide alternative fuels for aviation and some of the other transport uses that will be difficult to electrify like big 18 wheel trucks. Um, it's a again, it's a solution that works in the laboratory, but the problem is scale. Can we scale that up in time to actually keep an aviation industry going? I'm doubtful about it. I think we should be looking at scaling down the aviation industry if we're really serious about reducing carbon emissions. And then what can we do locally about uh, economic growth? Well, um, localizing finance, is a is a, a really strategic way of doing that. So keeping your money in a local credit union, a nonprofit credit union, as opposed to a you know a big national banking institution, uh, very advisable if if you can do that. Um, uh, making micro loans available to local farmers uh, uh, at low interest great thing to do making land available to local young young people who want to go into farming you know i've i've met uh dozens of really idealistic young people who want to farm they see this as an honorable profession 
but land has gotten too expensive. So they don't know if they can do that. Well, where is all that land? Who owns all that land? Old people in my generation. So if there are any people in, in my generation who are listening who own land, <laughs> uh, look for some young idealistic farmers to share it with. Um, okay, next. Um, the following question from Tristan, our MEM student, says, in your essay, why understanding limits is the key to humanity's future? You mentioned we have flown so far from safe boundaries that our only possible landing path entails a crash. There is no essay answer to overshoot when it's gone to such lengths. What do you envision the crash to the current overshoot situation looking like? And how do you remain optimistic against such overwhelming odds? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, some kind of economic crash is more or less inevitable ahead. Uh, and it may end up looking like a financial crash um, because we've there's so much debt in the world. If you look at debt to GDP ratios, um, I have an article on this. It's going to be coming out in two or three days on resilience.org. Debt to GDP ratios globally, uh, not just government debt, but all debt have been increasing and increasing. And why? Well, that's basically a bet on future growth. So people in the financial industry are betting that the economy will continue to grow and grow and grow. But meanwhile, as for reasons we've already looked at, that's unlikely to happen beyond a certain point. Growth will stop for biophysical reasons on this finite planet of ours. So what happens when all of those bets go south at the same time? The mother of all financial crashes, much bigger than the Great Depression or the, the global financial uh, crisis of 2008, and that, you know that looks that looks pretty bad. So um, there are things we can do to get out ahead of that, and I've been talking about some of them just in the last few minutes. You know, localizing our own personal economies in credit unions learning how to make things of value and, and share them with our, our communities. Um, because some of these larger uh, national and global systems are going to become more and more dysfunctional as time goes on. And unfortunately, the vast majority of people have not been primed to expect that to happen. They've been primed by their politicians and economists to believe that growth can go on forever. So if it doesn't, then it must be somebody's fault. So when things start to come apart, the, the default tendency will be for people to look for someone to blame. And we already see this happening in our country with, you know, red states and blue states and people at each other's throats and talking different languages and unable to sit down at the same table together. That's no way to solve problems. These are problems that will be impacting all of society, all of humanity, and certainly all of all of us as Americans. So we need to learn how to talk about these things together in a non-confrontational way where we're taking taking each other's interests to heart. Um, great. Yeah, that's, we, we're actually dealing with a lot of that in one of our assignments right now. Um, Graham Molinaro, one of our MEM students, asks, and this is a, a, always a really interesting topic, um, what do you think about nuclear energy as an option for alternative energy? Um, especially in light of some of the problems we see with uranium mining and, and what we deal with, how we deal with waste. I don't, I don't see uh, nuclear power as being very helpful in this situation. It's uh, first of all, it, it's much more expensive than solar and wind are currently. And the lead time for construction of new nuclear plants, even these new modular small reactors that they're talking about, which are still mostly just on the drawing boards, uh, the lead time for building a, a new reactor is, you know, very, very long time, many, many years, and they're uh, virtually always huge cost overruns, and the ratepayers get stuck with the with the bill afterward. 
and we don't know what to do with nuclear waste. So there, there are some people like uh, Bill Gates, who you know has been writing a lot about climate change recently, and he's he's a pro nuke guy. I disagree with him. I just don't see any usefulness in uh, in nuclear power in this situation. Um, also, uh, El Boss is asking, you say that we need to electrify to lower emissions, but then that electricity is a dependency. What, do, what would you say to this conundrum? Yeah, well, if, if we can de-energize uh, some human activities, that's better than electrifying them. Uh, electrification is the, the one good thing about electrification is that it produces some key efficiencies. See, the way we generate electricity now is by burning stuff, coal, natural gas mostly. And that's extremely inefficient. We waste most of the energy, 60% of the energy in that process. With solar and wind power, you're producing uh, uh, electricity directly. So less loss. Same thing with, with electric cars. Electric motors are much more energy efficient than internal combustion engines. So you're wasting much less energy. Even if you're getting your electricity from a natural gas-fired power plant, you're still actually reducing your greenhouse gas emissions if you have an electric car. So there are problems with electric cars. Obviously, you know, it, the amount of energy and materials it takes to make them is actually greater, considerably greater than the energy inputs and materials inputs in, a, in an internal combustion engine car. However, the electric car is going to last a lot longer. It's a much simpler motor, more efficient motor. So, you know, I, I drive an electric car. I think, you know, if you're going to buy a car, electric car is a good idea. But uh, cars are inherently ener energy inefficient as compared to public transportation, bicycles, and walking. So wherever we can get people walking and bicycling, that's by far the better choice. And then electric vehicles as a, as a stopgap. Awesome. So we have a we also have kind of a, a two part question here from uh, one of our MEM students, Andrew. Um, so he starts off with what are your thoughts on eco villages in the USA as a community scale response to inefficient, isolating single family homes? How can we shift mindsets to embrace co housing solutions as the solution, even as desirable, rather than just as a temporary situation until a family can purchase a traditional single family home slash for the poor. And then he follows up with another question, which is related. How can we shift mindsets to embrace co-housing solutions as the solution, even as desirable, rather than as just a temporary situation until a family can purchase a single family home um, for the poor? What are your thoughts on eco villages? I guess he's kind of repeating the question in the yeah. sense in the USA as a community scale response to inefficient, isolating single family home? I think it's a great response. And um, I've lived in intentional communities for a big chunk of my life. And it was a wonderful experience. Um, unfortunately, many intentional communities are, are cults. <laughs> it's, it's just a simple fact. So don't get, don't join a cult just to be part of an intentional community, but eco villages are a different category. Uh, typically they are, they're not cultic. They're, they're run democratically. And um, uh, I visited many of them and they're, you know, you get to be around other smart, idealistic people and, and share the goal of solving humanity's biggest crises together in, in the way you, you live your life. It's, they're, they're, I can only say good things about my experience with eco-villages. So if, that's, if you think that's an option for you, I would, I would encourage you. And so how do we change the mindset? By more people doing it and by people who, who live in co-housing and in eco-villages you know, spreading the word. I, I, there's no better way than that. I mean, there there are some documentaries out there that people have made, and that's great. You know, so show the show the documentaries. 
And here we have another question coming from a developing country, and also our MEM student. And she says, I come from a developing country and a community uh, has always been naturally a big aspect of my life. So I understand the benefits of building community resilience, but it is not the same case everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Do you have any suggestions on how to start building community resilience in a country such as the USA, where individual right is considered human right and where individualism is always a priority? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, you're right. It's harder in the U.S. to do some of these things than it is in other countries. Uh, if we're looking, for example, at Europe, you have thousands of villages and towns that were designed and built before the automobile. Right. So there's the, the infrastructure already there to return to a way of life that's based on walking or bicycling, um, where there's a, a, already a local food system. Great. Uh, here in the U.S., unfortunately, and, and the same in, in many parts of Asia and, and other countries, South America and so on. But here in the U.S., of course, we've had the benefits of cheap fossil fuels and economic growth for all these decades. And what have we done? We've built cities that depend upon more of the same. And that's that's a that's a challenge we're going to have to overcome. We're going to have to redesign our cities so that they work, can work without cheap fossil fuels. And more and more people, I think, are going to have to reconsider living in cities. Uh, I, uh, I have a colleague uh, who wrote a, a wonderful paper called The Future is Rural. So if you go to uh, postcarbon.org, which is my organization's website, and uh, and uh, search for that. You'll find a, some really interesting thoughts uh, uh, about how, in fact, you know that this demographic trend toward urbanization is necessarily going to to turn around sometime within our lifetimes, and the trend is going to be for cities to empty out for people to live more in the countryside where they can grow more of their own food. Very interesting. So here we have a um, follow up question to what Elle asked. Um, this is from uh, <clears throat> one of our MEM students as well, um, which her question was, uh, as states begins to elect, as states begin to electrify like California banning any new natural gas lines, how effective towards lowering emissions are these policies if bans only apply to new buildings in a region? Right. Well, the way the way to uh, deal with existing infrastructure is to provide incentives. Um, for example, you know, I live in a, a house that was built in 1953, and it had a natural gas heater wall wall heater, um, and we replaced that with a uh, electric heat pump. The heat pump is great. It uh, it's cheap. Uh, it's, you know, we're comfortable, uh, it's inexpensive to operate, but it costs a bunch of money. <laughs> and the, the you know, if you, if, especially if you're talking about low income folks, they're not going to be looking, or if they're renters, they're not going to be looking at replacing natural gas heaters with, with electric heat pumps. The only way that's going to happen is if government offers some incentives. And that is happening in a number of places. Vermont is looking at that right now. And uh, if you look at what's the debate that's going on in the Vermont state legislature right now, it's all about how to create the most effective incentives for people to install. Vermont is a cold state. So if they can, uh, if they can, a lot of their home energy use is in heating rather than more, more in heating than in transportation. So if they can, incentivize a lot of Vermonters to install heat pumps, they'll save a lot of fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions. Same thing can happen in Colorado. And one more now from uh, students of the environmental and sustainability. Is it possible to bring about economic growth using a reform? 
It's possible theoretically. Um, there was a, an economist who just died this last December uh, named Herman Daly, who was absolutely brilliant. And he pioneered the thinking in this area. He wrote a number of books on what he called the steady state economy and how to achieve a steady state economy and how to do so without completely upsetting the financial and policy and political apple cart. Um, and it, it included ideas like getting off of GDP. Right now, we use GDP to measure our economic well-being as a, as a country and, and globally. And, and the way we, we decide whether we're economically successful is if GDP is growing. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're happier or our lives are better or we're healthier or living longer or anything like that. It just means we're using more money. That's all it means. So if we started measuring how people are actually doing in their lives, how happy they are, their state of health, the quality of their relationships, and there are ways of doing this with surveys and statistics and so on, then we could aim to improve people's lives in ways that don't require a lot of energy use. And we'd be much more successful. And there's a whole movement called gross national happiness as a replacement for GDP. That's uh, there's already a country that's that, that's pioneered this, uh, the nation of Bhutan. Um, so the, unfortunately, the U.S. federal government has zero interest in gross national happiness or steady state economy currently. Hopefully that will change, but, but there are a lot of minds that need to be changed in order for that to happen. Thank you, quite interesting. So we have a few more questions here. Um, I'd like to maybe, we've only got a few more minutes, but um, how do you build community resilience in areas where the demographics are vastly different? Hmm. Yeah, uh, that, that's tough. I mean, you've got to you've got to get people looking out for each other's interest and caring about each other. And it and with um, in communities where people are speaking different languages or the the economic demographics are are very very different, it's it's more di it, that's more difficult. It's easier for people to blame each other and to be irritated by each other than to really want to work together. But we've got to understand we're all in this together. If if we if some of us sink, uh, it's it's more likely that all of us will. Uh, if if some of us can swim, well, we gotta we gotta carry some other people with us, and and we just have to have that mindset. And uh, and and you know the the thing is, if you have that mindset, and you get out in the community and you talk to people, people love it. That's attractive. Uh, everybody wants to associate with people who have an attitude of solving problems and of making connections between people. So it's hard work. There's no getting around that, but it's very rewarding and it's it, it makes all the difference. Thank you. Yeah. And another one, probably the last one. Let's see. I have here approaches to going back to a biomass energy system. I was wondering if you have any input on this. Well, the, the key to going back to biomass is, uh, is scale. Because if, if we tried to burn biomass to produce as much energy as we're currently using from fossil fuels, we'd burn up the biosphere in no time at all. You know, literally, like in a couple of years, we'd burn up the entire global biosphere to produce that much energy. So yes, I think we do need to return to biomass energy to a certain degree. But if you look at, for example, the U.S., we're using more biomass energy today than we were at 1800. Now, of course, there are more people, but it's not like you know we've stopped burning firewood and and uh, and agricultural waste and so on. We're doing it in larger quantities now than they, than we were before fossil fuels. We're just doing it in. We just have fossil fuels in addition to that. So we have to burn biomass more intelligently with fewer, not just carbon emissions, but also other kinds of pollution. And 
you know, where we can do that, great, and and do it within the scale of what the biosphere can regenerate on an annual basis. Again, great. But those are, those are the limitations. All right, should we should we go for this one last question? I think that last question is a good one for closing. Yeah, and it will take just a few minutes, just sort of mm -hmm. still time. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is from one of our MEM students. So many people consider energy as security individually and nationally. And in thinking about energy, it seems that weapons and war are one of the largest sectors of energy use and consumption. What is your opinion on any possibility of decarbonizing this sector? And can global emissions be reduced without including this sector? Well, well they can. Of course, they can be reduced without including this sector, but can they be reduced enough? I guess is the is the, you know, that's really at the heart of that question. Probably not. I mean, uh, <clears throat> about about ten percent of U.S. emissions are associated with the military in one way or another. So that's not. It's not certainly not a majority of U.S. emissions, but it's not. On the other hand, it's not negligible. Um, can we operate the military without fossil fuels? In principle, yes. But again, we're, we're getting back to those alternative fuels that would have to be produced by building a whole new, uh, basically replacing the fossil fuel industry with an industry that's electrolyzing water and making hydrogen and doing all this other chemistry to get a, a, an alternative fuel in quantity. So the, I mean, obviously the, what we should be doing is scaling down the military, not just in this country, but around the world. And in order to do that, you've got to reduce tensions. Uh, that's easier said, said than done. But if we don't do that, I'm just afraid we're gonna be, be at each other's throats in the decades ahead. You know, there's gonna be so much hard feeling about, you know, the, the the difficulties we'll be facing, and people, as I said earlier, people will be looking for someone to blame. And it's not just, you know, Democrats and Republicans blaming each other. It'll be uh, countries doing the same thing. Uh, and if if we go that route, it's it's a very, very ugly future. So anything we can do to demilitarize, to reduce the scale of tensions internationally, will will head at least some of that off. Well, it seems like the common done, but theme, it's important. Yeah, go ahead. It, se it seems like the common theme that you've touched on uh, locally, regionally, nationally, and globally is that we need to understand each other and, and learn to, to work together and find common right. ground. And I was telling our students a few classes that the case of Costa Rica, having quality of life, depended mm -hmm. very much in a certain time in their history when they decided to decrease the military and the army of the country and invest that's that right. in education and health. It's not a rich country, but it's a happier one. Mm -hmm. And with this, Richard, we really want to thank you. You are more than welcome to Western Colorado. We hope to have you once or more than once in person. And um, thank you for this. I'd, I'd be very happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much for, for taking the time and, and just sharing what your knowledge. It's great. Yeah. Well, th thanks for the invitation and good luck to everyone who's who's been listening and who's been asking these great questions. All See the best. You next time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. It's